This is a homily for the fifth Sunday of Lent. The first reading is from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. The gospel for this Sunday comes from the gospel of St. John, chapter 12, verses 20 to 33. If you would like to receive a weekly copy of my homilies as a PDF file, email me at jeffreyplant47 at gmail.com. On the Sundays of ordinary time, the lectionary chooses the first reading because, in one way or another, it complements the theme of the Gospel. The second reading, usually taken from one of the New Testament letters, is on a cycle of its own, and it is purely coincidental if it happens to reflect the same theme as the Gospel and first reading. However, during Lent, the lectionary arranges the readings thematically. In Year B, for example, the first readings for Lent focus on the theme of covenant. The second readings are about the identity of Christ and our identity in Christ. The Gospel readings are on the theme of salvation. So let's see how the first readings for each Sunday of Lent are on the theme of God's covenant with his people. On the first Sunday of Lent, we had an account of the covenant that God entered into after the flood. The covenant was made with Noah, with Noah's descendants, with all the living creatures that were in the ark, and finally, it was a covenant with the earth itself. The rainbow was to be a sign of this covenant. On the second Sunday of Lent, we had the story of the testing of Abraham, recorded in the book of Genesis. The name Abraham means father of a multitude. But how will Abraham fulfill his destiny if he sacrifices his son Isaac. This is a test, and because Abraham obeys the voice of God, he will be blessed, and God makes a covenant with him. I will shower blessings on you. I will make your descendants as many as the stars of heaven and the grains of sand on the seashore. On the third Sunday of Lent, we heard the account of God giving the law to Moses. The Ten Commandments include the basic conditions for covenant membership. Last Sunday's first reading from the second book of Chronicles told the story of the destruction of Solomon's temple by the Babylonians and the exile of the people by the rivers of Babylon. But the reading ends on a note of of hope. God rouses Cyrus, the Persian king who had conquered the Babylonians, to order the rebuilding of the temple. The second book of Chronicles tells us that the destruction of the temple was a result of the sinfulness of the people. Not only did the people ignore the prophets that God sent to them, they actively derided them. The destruction of the temple and the deportation of the people were the inevitable consequences of their sinfulness, of their infidelity to the covenant. But through the graciousness of God, the process of rebuilding the temple begins through the agency of a foreign king. Today's first reading from the prophet Jeremiah promises a new covenant for the house of Israel who because of their infidelities had been chastened for a time. Whereas the Old Covenant had been written on stone tablets, the law of the New Covenant will be written on the heart. The essence of the covenant is this, I will be your God and you shall be my people. The Gospel readings have focused on salvation. 
On the first Sunday of Lent, we had a brief account of Jesus being tested in the desert. But then we're told that Jesus begins the proclamation of the good news with the words, Repent and believe the good news. That, in a nutshell, is what salvation entails. On the second Sunday of Lent, we heard Mark's account of the transfiguration. A voice coming from the cloud says of Jesus, This is my Son, the Beloved. Listen to him. So, salvation is listening to the Son, allowing his saving word to form, inform, and reform us. On the third Sunday of Lent, we heard John's account of the cleansing of the temple. This prophetic gesture was not saying that the institution of the temple needed to be reformed. It was saying that the days of the temple are numbered. The Jerusalem temple has been replaced by the body of Jesus as the true holy place, as the place of mediation between God and humanity. Jesus himself is our saviour. In last Sunday's Gospel, Jesus tells Nicodemus that the Son of Man must be lifted up, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert. Moses' lifting up of the bronze snake in the desert foreshadows the lifting up of Jesus on the cross. Just as the bronze serpent was a life-giving antidote to the deadly venom, whoever looks at the crucified in faith, receives something far beyond ordinary life. They receive a share in the eternal life of God. Humanity as a whole has been smitten with a deadly disease. The lifting up of Jesus on the cross is our salvation. On this fifth Sunday of Lent, Jesus tells us that his hour has come. He tells us that unless a wheat grain falls into the earth and dies, it remains only a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Therefore, salvation is about losing our life so that we will keep it for eternal life. The Gospels for the first and second Sundays of Lent came from the Gospel of St. Mark, but the Gospels for weeks 3, 4 and 5 have all come from the Gospel of St. John. In John's Gospel, the identity of Jesus is deeply embedded in Israel's texts and traditions, especially the traditions centred on the Temple and Israel's annual feasts. Consider, for example, the way in which the evangelist uses Jewish festivals as a backdrop to the story he's telling. This is especially true of the way he uses the festival of Passover. Passover begins on the 15th day of the month of Nisan. Because the Jews used a lunar calendar, the date of Passover falls in late March or early April. This year, for example, Passover begins before sundown on Monday, April the 22nd. New Testament scholar Tom Wright reminds us of the importance of Passover for Judaism. The most formative narrative in all Judaism is the story of the Exodus, Israel's release from slavery in Egypt. Jacob's descendants have multiplied and have become slaves in Egypt. The Egyptians are harsh and bullying taskmasters. God hears the cry of his people and comes to deliver them. Unlike the three synoptic Gospels, which have only one Passover, there are three Passovers in John's Gospel. The first Passover forms the backdrop to the cleansing of the temple. John tells us that the time of the Jewish Passover was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. 
The second Passover is the backdrop to the story of the multiplication of the loaves and fishes. Just as God fed his people with manna and quails during the Exodus, Jesus feeds a huge multitude. But John makes it clear that this is a sign. Those who ate the manna grew hungry again. The bread of life which Jesus offers satisfies the deepest longings and yearnings of the human heart. The third Passover takes us from the beginning of chapter 12 until the end of chapter 19, so it forms the backdrop to today's Gospel. Note that almost half of John's Gospel is set against the backdrop of the festival of Passover. The fact that Jesus chose to die at this time becomes a key to understanding the meaning of his death. Let's look briefly at some of the ways in which John uses the Passover motif. In chapter 2, we hear the account of John the Baptist acknowledging Jesus as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. John the Evangelist doesn't explain what John the Baptist means when he calls Jesus the Lamb of God. To understand what calling Jesus the Lamb of God means, we need to fast forward to chapter 19. John's references to the Passover come to a climax in the Passion narrative, where Jesus' crucifixion takes place on the day before Passover. In chapter 19, John tells us that it was the day of preparation. This was the day on which the Passover lambs were slaughtered, something that could be carried out only in the temple. So, as thousands and thousands of lambs are being slaughtered in the temple, Jesus dies on Golgotha, just outside the walled city of Jerusalem. The book of Exodus tells us that the Jews were saved by the blood of the Passover lamb sprinkled on their doorposts. John is subtly telling us that we are saved by the blood of another Passover lamb, Jesus himself. But unlike the slaughter of the paschal lambs in the temple, a ritual repeated annually, the death of Jesus is the one perfect sacrifice that never needs to be repeated. In the words of Pope Benedict, Jesus dies at the moment when the Passover lambs are being slaughtered in the temple. Jesus dies as the real lamb, merely prefigured by those slain in the temple. Here's another subtle allusion to the Exodus story. The book of Exodus lays down instructions for the slaughter of the paschal lamb. It states that none of its bones are to be broken. It is John's Gospel alone that tells us that the soldiers broke the legs of the two men crucified alongside Jesus to hasten their death. But when they came to Jesus, they saw he was already dead. So they did not break his legs, but one of them pierced his side with a lance. John again alludes to the Passover ritual by telling us that the bones of Jesus, the Lamb of God, were not broken. Let's now turn to today's Gospel. We're told at the beginning of chapter 12 that it was six days before the Passover, and Jesus went to Bethany where Lazarus lived. Just in passing, Note that John's Gospel, which covers a ministry that may have lasted for as long as three years, devotes almost half of the Gospel to the last week in the life of Jesus. Jesus had been in Bethany when he raised Lazarus from the dead, and many of the Jews who had seen what he did believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees to tell them what Jesus had done. 
As a result, the chief priests and Pharisees planned to kill him. So Jesus no longer went about openly and departed for the district near the desert to a town called Ephraim, and he stayed there with his disciples. But six days before the Passover, Jesus returns to Bethany. Bethany, as you can see from this illustration, is just a short distance to the southeast of Jerusalem. From Bethany, Jesus makes his way to Jerusalem. The great crowd of pilgrims coming to Jerusalem for the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took palm branches and went out to greet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who is coming in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. This is the day that we traditionally celebrate as Palm or Passion Sunday. We now meet some Greeks, but who are they? The Greek word that John uses, Hellenes, makes it clear that they are Gentiles and not Greek-speaking Jews. But they're obviously Greeks who are attracted to Israel's God, because they're present in Jerusalem for the celebration of Passover. Jesus has already said that other sheep not belonging to the fold would join his flock. With the coming of these two Greeks, that moment is now at hand. Their eagerness to see Jesus contrasts with the Pharisees and chief priests who are planning to kill him. These Greeks approach Philip. Sir, we should like to see Jesus. Philip then passes on this request to Andrew, and both Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. Let's pause for a moment to consider the request that the Greeks are making. We should like to see Jesus. The Greek verb that John uses is idain. In John's Gospel, this verb refers on one level to the everyday experience of seeing. But obviously the Greeks are hoping to do more than just physically see Jesus. They want to meet him. And that's what we mean when we say to someone, could I make an appointment to see you? We obviously want to do more than just look at the person. We're asking for an opportunity to meet and talk with them. The Greeks obviously want to meet Jesus, but it is more than likely that they are hoping to become disciples. That brings us to another way in which we use the word see. The Greek verb idain can also be used in a metaphorical sense, meaning perceiving or understanding. When we say, aha, now I see what you mean, or now I see what you're saying, we're talking about a moment of perception, discovery or understanding. It's about seeing things differently. This is getting close to the meaning of the word see as it's used in John's Gospel. So while the Greek verb idain in John's Gospel often refers to the everyday experience of seeing, more often than not it means to see in the sense of believing in. It is used in contexts that deal with the revelation of God in and through Jesus. Let's now return to these Greeks wanting to see Jesus. They approach Philip. The fact that they've singled out Philip may have been quite random, but it is far more likely that they sought out one of Jesus' disciples who would have been familiar with their world. So they sought out a disciple with a Greek name. Philip was a very popular Greek name, and it means lover of horses or fond of horses. It was the name of Alexander the Great's father. Philip then goes and tells Andrew, another disciple with a Greek name. Andrew has the meaning of manly, brave or strong. 
Keep in mind that we've already met both Philip and Andrew in chapter 1 of John's Gospel. Andrew and an unnamed companion are with John the Baptist, and when John points out Jesus as the Lamb of God, they begin to follow Jesus. Jesus turns around and sees Andrew and his companion following him, so he asks them, What do you seek? They reply, Rabbi, where do you live? Jesus says to them, Come and see. Note the use of the verb see. They came and saw and spent that day with him. Andrew then finds his brother Simon and says to him, We have found the Messiah. He then brings Simon to Jesus. The following day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. He finds Philip and says, Follow me. No sooner had Philip been called than he meets up with Nathanael. He tells Nathanael, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote. Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Nathanael replies in disbelief, From Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip says to him, Come and see. Note once again the use of that same Greek verb, idain, see. And notice also that Philip, like Andrew, brings someone to Jesus. Now here's a fine vocation for every one of us to be like Philip and Andrew, someone who brings people to Jesus. Because in John's Gospel Philip and Andrew were the first to receive the invitation to discipleship directly from Jesus, their presence here establishes a connection between the call of the first Jewish disciples and the arrival of the first Gentile disciples. Pope Benedict offers this reflection. Being Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea, but the encounter with an event, a person, which gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction. So Philip and Andrew now want to bring some other people to see Jesus. Together they inform him that some Greeks would like to see him. What happens next may sound a little strange. Jesus seems to ignore completely the request of the Greeks to see him. You'd suppose that he might have said something like, How wonderful! Bring them here and I'll talk to them. But he doesn't say that at all. Instead, what he says seems, on the face of it, to ignore their request completely. What he says is, Now the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Before we consider how Jesus is responding to the request of the Greeks to see him, let's look at what Jesus means when he talks about his hour. When the wine ran out at the wedding feast of Cana, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. He replied, Woman, what is that to me and to you? My hour has not yet come. In chapter 7, we read that the authorities wanted to arrest Jesus, but no one laid hands on him because, we're told, his hour had not yet come. And again in chapter 8 we read, He spoke these words while he was teaching in the treasury of the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. Up to this point, the hour has always been in the future. But here, in chapter 12, his hour has come. And the hour is, of course, the hour of of his death and glorification. Jesus likens his death to sowing a seed into the ground. I tell you most solemnly, unless a wheat grain falls on the ground and dies, 
it remains only a single grain, but if it dies, it yields a rich harvest. Jesus has already spoken of his death in life-giving terms. Let's go back to last Sunday's Gospel, which came from chapter 3 of John's Gospel. There Jesus alluded to an incident recorded in chapter 21 of the book of Numbers. During the Exodus, the people were saved from poisonous serpents by looking upon the effigy of a bronze serpent. Likewise, humanity has been smitten with a deadly disease, and the only cure is to look at the Son of Man dying on the cross and find life through believing in Him. But in today's Gospel, the image is not of Jesus being lifted up, but of him falling into the ground like a seed and dying. The theme of the seed that is buried in the ground and then bearing fruit is found in the Synoptic Gospels as well as in John. But John gives this image a special twist. The seed is Jesus himself, who by dying will give life to humanity. Just as a seed must die to its life as a single seed before it can yield an abundant harvest, Jesus will bring life in abundance through his death on the cross. Jesus then returns to the image of being lifted up. Now sentence is being passed on this world. Now the prince of this world is to be overthrown. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I shall draw all people to myself. And here we have the answer that Jesus gives to the Greeks who want to see him. These Gentile Greeks will truly see Jesus, but only when he is lifted up. The Greek word that John uses here, hupso'o, is deliberately ambiguous. It can refer to a crucifixion, to a person being lifted up on a cross. But it can also refer to an enthronement, to a person being lifted up to a position of king and ruler. So, which is it? Crucifixion or enthronement? John the Evangelist is using the word in both senses. Here we are confronted with the paradox of the cross, an excruciating instrument of torture and death is also a throne from which Jesus reigns triumphantly. But why does Jesus have to die in order to draw all people to himself? The English biblical scholar Tom Wright offers this observation. You do not have to be able to answer the question why before the cross can have its effect. Think about it. You don't have to understand music theory or acoustics to be moved by a wonderful violin solo. You don't have to understand cooking before you can enjoy a good meal. In the same way, you don't have to have a theory about why the cross is so powerful before you can be moved and changed, before you can know yourself loved and forgiven because of Jesus' death. Jesus adds something else. He is pioneering a route along which we, his servants, we, his disciples, must also travel. Those who love their life will lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for the eternal life. This paradox is, in fact, the inescapable rhythm of our human journey. Die before you die, so that when you die, you won't die. In her book, Necessary Losses, the American writer Judith Vyrost makes this observation. Losses are a part of life, universal, unavoidable, inexorable. 
And these losses are necessary because we grow by losing and leaving and letting go. Passionate investment leaves us vulnerable to loss. And sometimes, no matter how clever we are, we must lose. But it is only through our losses that we become fully developed human beings. On the day that the Cistercian monk Thomas Merton began his solitary life as a hermit, he asked the Gethsemane community to pray for him. And when you pray for me, all I ask that you pray for is that, above all, I should completely forget my own will and completely surrender to the will of God, because this is all I want to do. Consider the final lines of Johann Wolfgang von Goethe's poem, The Holy Longing. And so long as you haven't experienced this, to die and so to grow, you are only a troubled guest on the dark earth. Those who love their life will lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for the eternal life.